Good evening. Good evening. It's great that we can all be here together to have another opportunity to worship God together. It's great that we can have another time to uh, have some fellowship with one another. If you missed this evening, that wonderful fellowship meal, you really missed out on something. It was great. I couldn't believe the number of plates I saw Wayne eat, but I'm surprised more and more every time. We won't say anything about how much I ate. But as great as that meal was earlier and as amazing food that was, I hope we find a little different kind of food tonight. You see, in our series we've been doing on Sunday nights, we have just started this. Last week was I Heart God, or I Love God. And this evening's is I Heart, or I Love the Word. The reason I bring up food is because tonight we're going to be talking about spiritual food. The spiritual nourishment for our souls. Without which, we will certainly starve. If you have our Bibles with you this evening, and I hope you do, turn over to Psalm 119. And our primary text for this evening's lesson is going to be Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104. Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104. I'm going to have it here on the screen beside me. But once again, as always, I'd encourage you to turn there as well in your Bible to follow along. Throughout our lesson tonight, I hope we see a couple things. First, that there are certain things that we need to do in relation to the Word, the Word of God. Second, that we can never, ever, ever, ever feel that we've accomplished enough when it comes to soaking in the Word. One of the great things about the Bible is the deeper you go and the more in-depth you look into study, you see that the well goes deeper and deeper and deeper. God's wisdom is so amazing. Sometimes we find similar things with other parts of literature. You ever read a book, and then when you reread it the second time, you got something out of it you didn't quite get the first time? Sometimes I'll read a book that I really like, or a series I really like, over and over again, because I notice little things I didn't notice before. The more acquainted you become with a story or with a book, you'll pick up the other things. You'll soak in more data, more information. And such is certainly true with the Bible but on a much higher and greater level because the author of the Bible is the all-knowing, all-powerful God of the universe who created the very thought process that we used to read. Certainly he's planted in there so much there for us. We could study our entire lifetime to barely scratch the surface of all the wisdom that God has for us to glean. If you will follow along with me there again in Psalm 119. What's interesting about this psalm is that Throughout this huge, huge psalm here, he uses every letter of the Hebrew alphabet to praise the Word of God. I would encourage you on your own time to read all the way through this psalm. It's an amazing psalm. We'll read it, quite a bit of it this evening in different parts. Psalm 119. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ages, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. This evening, if there's nothing else you get out of this study, I hope you remember these three memory points and the implications of them. First, if we're truly going to love the Word, we have to ask ourselves, do I meditate on it? Do I meditate on it? Second, you have to ask ourselves, do I understand it? Am I getting something out of it? Am I understanding it? And third, and finally, do I keep it? Is it something that I keep, that I practice? Now, we're going to deal with each of these in time. And this first one may have hit you a little bit the wrong way. You may be thinking, meditate? Well, Jake, I don't meditate on the Bible. We might think of meditation as where you sit with your legs crossed and your hands out to the side like this and just be real quiet. That's not actually the idea here found in the word meditate. In actuality, this kind of idea comes all, is also found in Psalm 1. And in Psalm 1, the man who meditates on the Bible is like someone who is a, a tree planted by a stream of water. And literally there in Psalm 1, the, the idea is that it sticks with you. So much so that as you go throughout your day, as you go throughout your life, 
You're muttering it back. It's catchy. It's something that you've heard so much that it's just stuck in your head, similar to jingles and other catchphrases in advertising. Well, that's kind of the idea here. But it goes a little deeper than just remembering it. It goes a little deeper than just playing it over in your head. It's thinking about it. Spending time contemplating on it. The question might be asked, when have I read enough? Psalm 1 and verse 2 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates every once in a while. On his law he meditates every other day. Once a week on Sunday. On his law he meditates whenever he feels like it. No, that's not what the psalmist said. On his law he meditates day and night. Generally we're lucky if we read our Bibles about one time a day. I don't think I'm being too bold there. Generally, as Christians, we're lucky if we read our Bibles one time a day. That's usually far escaping. In fact, some congregations, they have a practice in their Sunday morning Bible class. They'll ask all their daily Bible readers to raise their hand. And everyone who that week was able to read their Bibles every day will raise their hand. Unfortunately, even in congregations where this is practice, you don't see all the hands raised. In fact, some places you should even see the majority raised. That might be kind of depressing, but it ought to also encourage us to something more. You see, the man who's planted by that stream of water in Psalm 1 is the one who's meditating on the law day and night. Someone who's spending time in the work, trying to learn about it. Someone who's spending time focusing on it, thinking about it. Contemplating what this might mean, what it's trying to say. What wisdom can I glean out of this? In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13, Paul commands Timothy. It's an imperative phrase there. It's not a suggestion. This isn't something that he can do or not do. He tells Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. There were times that the church gathered together just to read the Bible together. That was their purpose. We're not talking specifically about their time when they gathered for the Lord's Supper. We're not talking about specifically times they gathered together to sing or to pray. It was common for them to have prayer meetings. It was common for them to have these separate worship services throughout the week. But Paul says, as a command, until I come, devote yourself. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Read the Word together. It wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't an idea that you might should do this. He said, this is what you need to do. It's interesting that in that chapter and in the surrounding context, he's been giving Timothy orders. Orders concerning how the church ought to be kept in order. Things he ought to do to make sure that God's group of people is acting as they should act. He gives many other instructions for worship too. The question then comes to us. <coughs> Am I meditating on the Word of God? Not just something every once in a while, but you know, that was interesting what I heard last week. Let me think on that for a minute. We're talking about a constant practice of this. Your own private study. Something that you do yourself personally, maybe with a spouse or a friend, on a regular basis. Surely we can devote a little bit of time every day to reading the Bible. I know there are places in the world where people sit down and eat, read the morning paper with their breakfast. Surely they can make it through a chapter, a couple verses. Surely we can devote a little bit of time to God. But I digress, we need to move on. Apart from meditation, there's something further than that. Not just spending time thinking about it, but then having something accomplished out of that time spent. Do I understand something? Now, this might be where the rubber meets the road, you might say. Now, some might object and say, well, some things are just too hard to understand. I agree that there are some things where the secret things belong to God. Deuteronomy 29, 29, I understand it completely. But are we to expect that there's no way we can understand the majority of this? That God hasn't given us any opportunity or any way for us to understand the majority of this book written to us? Sometimes we read over a verse and say, man, I don't understand it. Oh, well, let's move on to something else. That's not what we're talking about. You can apply yourself and study something. 
You can seek it out. One of the greatest blessings we have might also be our greatest curse. We have the internet. If you have no library yourself, no religious library, if you have access to the internet at all, and if you were then walking distance to the library in Campbell, you have access to the internet. If you have any access at all to the internet, you have countless, countless resources at your fingertips. For that matter, when you're walking to the, in, to the library, you might see some things there that could help you in your study. What are, is expected of us? Does God Himself value us understanding His Bible, His book? Yes, He does. In 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 11, Solomon had made a request. Solomon had made a request for wisdom. He wanted to understand. He wanted to make good decisions. Now I realize here that Solomon himself is not talking about just reading the Bible and understanding what it says. He's talking about something a lot more than that. We may not have realized this, but the kings were required... They had been required by the law to whenever they became a king to sit down and write the law in their own hand so that they would know it. And so that when they went to judge Israel, when they went to be a king over Israel, they would do it according to what God had told them to. You see, the king on earth of Israel was only a representative of the king in heaven of Israel. And what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 11, And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. What did he then say? He said he was going to give him these other things too. He would grant him what he asked. God was pleased. Why? Because Solomon wanted to understand. He put value in this, and so did God. Can you imagine such a thing? God wants you to take this book He has given you, to take this blessing bound in pages, and to learn from it, and to take it into your heart and let it shine out through your life. This isn't just something He gave us to put on the shelf and gather dust. This isn't just something He gave us so that we could come to Bible classes and sermons and Turn to the pages whenever they bring them up. This is our own handbook. Apart from just God valuing understanding and being something He likes, is it something that's necessary? Is it something that we need to do? Because there's quite a big difference in things that we should do or that would be good for us to do and things that we need to do. If it's something that's imperative that we need to do it. If it's that important, then we ought to be paying more attention to it and putting more effort into it. In Psalm 119, this still this great psalm that spends its entire time blessing and glorifying the Word of God, in verse 34, notice what the psalmist says. Give me understanding. Why? Why did the psalmist want understanding? Well, he doesn't leave us hanging. He answers us, then I might keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. How can you keep what you haven't spent time to understand? How can you follow and practice being godlike if you haven't put in the effort to understand the guidebook he's given you? His own image impressed on it just as it is impressed on us. Paul describes it to Timothy as the very breath of God. That God breathed. And here are these pages. It's amazing to me to see how much value there is in the Word of God. It's amazing to me to see what it can do. I wish we had time to read through this entire psalm today. I wish we had the opportunity where we could because there's just so much there in what it can provide. You see, our last point this evening is really a culmination of the other two. As far from spending time in meditation on God's Word and seeking and applying due diligence to understand what it's saying, it does us no good to do these things if I don't keep it, if I don't act upon it, if something doesn't happen then because of this. We've been studying the book of James in our Sunday morning Bible class. 
And one of the things that we've sparked upon the discussion is the idea of doing something, not just thinking about it. The idea of acting and not just speaking. The idea of being a doer and not just a hearer. It's good to understand the Bible. It's good to meditate upon it. But if that's all that happens, you've wasted your time. James chapter 1 verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. James goes on to describe the person who does this <laughs> as someone who looks at his face in the mirror, and when he goes away, he forgets what he looks like. It's of no value. It's of not accomplishing anything. See, God doesn't just want us to read the Bible two, three, four times a day. He doesn't just want us to spend a couple hours in study trying to understand what it means, how it applies to us, and how it can make my life more pleasing to Him. He does want that. Let me assure you, He wants that. But that's not all that He wants. Yes, He asks more. He asks that after you study, that after you apply yourself to seek the treasure that's found in here, that you then act upon it, that you live it, that you be a doer, not just a hearer. I know the next point might be a little small if you're on the screen, but in Psalm 19, Psalmist once again paints us a beautiful picture of what blessings can come out of being a doer, not just hearing the word, but then taking it and living it out. What blessings can the Word of God give you in your life? Psalm 19 illustrates them. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, <coughs> reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. <coughs> I wonder often if we value what we're holding in our hands as much as we should. Do you value this more than fine gold? Do you value this more than precious metal? One thing I try to do when I visit my grandfather is to stop along the way over to Paducah, whether it be at Lambert's or someplace along the way, and sometimes they'll have these little canned goods that the Amish make, and one of them in particular is honey with some honeycomb. You know, it's the simple things in life that really just make you smile. And he loves to get out a little bit of that honeycomb and to have it on his biscuits and to mix it in with his soup and other things he has there. And it's just something that he really likes. I wonder if we have that same joy in our heart towards the Word of God. If we think it's as sweet as honey. If when we get an opportunity to read it, to study, to talk about it with someone, if we're just delighted because of how sweet it is. If we view it as not a burden for us to have to be lifted, but a joy, something that's helping to guide our life in the truth, to bless us on every corner, keeping us away from evil, from trouble, or we see it as a leash holding us back. You see, it's all the way you view things. It's all in the way you look at things. And David, here in Psalm 19, he valued the Word of God. He loved it. I'm not so sure we all love the Word of God. I'm not so sure that we all care deeply for it. It seems like we see it as a burden that has to be borne, a weight that has to be lifted, a chore that has to be done. But it's not, it's a blessing. Where would we be without? What would we have to talk about tonight? What would you have to teach you right and wrong? I want you to imagine for a moment that all the lights were out in this room. All the windows were covered, the doors, everything was pitch black and dark. 
and you're barefoot. And scattered around on the entire floor is a jax. If you don't know what a jack is, then you didn't have a very fun childhood. If you don't know what a jack is, imagine something else that's pokey, Lego or something like that. And there's a path leading from where you're standing to the door. But you don't have it. You don't have any kind of map. How would that make you feel? Make you feel sad? Would you really appreciate that map if you had it? What would you give to be able to know the right path to get out of this room? Can you imagine feeling lost, scared, alone in the dark, not knowing where to go? If we can have that much emotion tied up into a simple, meaningless illustration like this, what about the Word of God? The Word that shines light in the darkness. The Word that guides us through this life tries to keep us from harm and pain and suffering. That tries to help us deter ourselves from an eternal punishment. But how often does it just get tossed aside? How often does it just get left as something to pick up once a week? This is a question we all need to deeply consider. Do I really love the Word? Do I really love it? I'm not set about talking about just saying yes because you think that's what you're supposed to say. I'm not talking about do you think it looks pretty on your shelf. Do you study this thing because it's your lifeline to God? Do you enjoy opening up this thing because it's a private message from God to you? Him speaking to you? Do you look forward to every opportunity you have a time to sit in a Bible class or a lesson like this because you're going to get to hear something out of this? Or is it just another burden to bear? Is it just something else you do? You see, if you don't love the Word, if that's not something that you love. The question I want to leave you with tonight is why? First and foremost, why are you here? Is it because you're curious? You want to know more about it? That's great. We would love to have the opportunity to talk to you. We would love to have the opportunity to let you know why this is such an amazing book. What sets this apart from the adventures of Tom Sawyer? What makes this so much better than the Chronicles of Narnia? What makes this better than the best romance novel you've ever read? We would love to have the opportunity to spend the time to talk to you about that because we love this. If you don't really love the Word, why are you here? You see, if you do know how good it is, you do know how much of a blessing it is, and you don't love it, why do you want to go to heaven? If you don't enjoy talking about this, learning about this, singing about this, praying about this, why are you going to a place where we're going to be doing it for all eternity? Is it because you don't want to go to the other place? Because that's not a good enough reason. That's probably one way to take it there. If you don't love this, why suffer? Why take the harsh treatment as a Christian? I'm not here tonight to beg and plead with you. To please just give Jesus a chance. I promise that if you just give him a chance, you'll find enjoyment here. That's not what he want me to say. That's not the lesson he would preach. And I tell you that not because I know everything Jesus would do, but because I read about his lifestyle. Just like I'm sure all of you have. I've read his sermons. Just like I'm sure you have. And while he said, come unto me, come unto me if you're weary of bearing this big burden, I'll give you rest. While he said that, he also said, take my yoke upon you. While he also said, I will provide you with life. Come and drink from me. He also said, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He didn't make it easy. He wanted people who love the Lord. He wanted people that when they see something so beautiful and so amazing, they cherish it, not discard it.
This evening, if you're here and you don't have a proper relationship with God, if you're not truly loving Him, and be sure that this is Him right here, and it's a great reflection on how you care about Him. If you're here and you don't have a love for God that's proper, you don't have a love for His Word that's proper, I suggest you make a change. If you can't bear to listen to lessons like this or Bible classes, if you can't bear to hear someone bring up another one in verses, I suggest you make a change tonight. Because if not, there might be eternal consequences. But if you're here and you love the Word and you love God, then please join me in a moment in standing up and singing with all your heart praises to the God who gave us. If you're subject to an invitation, we should come right now all together and stand and sing.